Hello everyone and welcome back to Dune Month here on Pop Culture Mixology. And today, we are getting totally political with the future government of the Duneiverse. Now before we jump right in, I would just like to talk to you guys about the Folio Society's 50 year anniversary edition of Dune. This book is absolutely incredible, you need to buy it, I'm telling you this right now, in fact I'll use the voice to do it. It is so freaking beautiful. It has full color illustrations by artist Sam Weber, and then a foreword by Pulitzer Prize winner Michael Durda, and an afterword by Brian Herbert, who's actually Frank Herbert's very own son. I left a link to the Folio Society below, and I'm telling you, you gotta get this book. Plus you get like free posters with it, and everybody loves free posters. So Dune has this sort of complex system of power and a very interesting history that goes behind it. And in order to understand that, you need to understand the most critical piece of importance in that whole thing, which is the Butlerian Jihad. So basically the Butlerian Jihad is when humanity end up rising up against artificial intelligence. Check it. 10,000 years before the events of the series, mankind was chilling it pretty cool with the artificial intelligence, and they became so dependent on it that when artificial intelligence decided to rise up, humanity became enslaved. And so, forcing themselves out of bondage, mankind basically fought against artificial intelligence and destroyed it. A couple of really big things happened because of this. One of them is that mankind kind of consolidated a whole lot of religions into one, known as Orange Catholicism. And so the Orange Catholic Bible, which is like the holy text of Unitarianism, radically changes everything that it means to be human. There are a couple of really big commandments in it. Like one of the biggest ones is thou shall not disfigure the soul, which is really all about like, you know, you have to maintain your ego, which is iffy. The other one is thou shall not create a machine in the likeness of man's mind. Pretty much what that means is that there can be no more computers, which is super troubling for a science fiction story because computers are like super important. So instead, mankind has to step up to the plate and start doing some of like the actual work. No more fat kids in the future. Now this is not to say there's no technology. There's still things like force fields, which protect a person obviously. And there's also stuff like las guns, which are, you know, laser guns. The unfortunate side effect is that when a las gun hits a shield, it pretty much creates an atomic explosion. So since nobody wants that, there's no more really artillery battles anymore, and pretty much everything is fought with like knives and swords, going very much so back to like a more primitive style of fighting. There's also some like other nifty technologies like glow globes and stuff, but without a doubt the most important piece of technology is space folding, which pretty much allows you to get from one end of the universe to the other instantaneously or very quickly. Out of the Butlerian Jihad, this noble family comes to assume complete power over the human race, and that is the Carino Empire. As of the beginning of the series, the current emperor is Emperor Shaddam IV Carino, who is like, you don't really get to see him throughout much of the book, but he's pretty powerful and intense. He has a daughter named Princess Irulan, and then also in his entourage, is a truth seer named Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohium. And she is what's known as a Bene Gesserit, which are essentially like witches. They have these crazy powers and no one really knows how they got them. We'll talk about them more in another video, but she really is important for the Emperor because she kind of like makes sure everything runs smoothly for him. So the Reverend Mother is kind of modeled after the witches from Macbeth. She's incredibly important, she's running all these schemes, and she's kind of like the head of the Bene Gesserit, which again, we'll get into in a later video. Her whole deal is about power and understanding the true philosophy behind everything. A really important scene in the book that really describes this well is her scene with Paul when she administers the test of the Gom Jabbar. Uh, that's a whole lot of fancy talk, but basically, the entire scene revolves around this philosophy and this almost philosophical battle between Paul and the Reverend Mother. Another huge advantage of the Empire is the Imperial Sardaukar, which are like the toughest warriors in the universe. The Sardaukar are pretty much how the Empire has maintained their hold on the universe for 10,000 years. They're trained on this planet named Salusa Secundus, which is like a prison planet and it's really harsh and really terrible. The trials to become a Sardaukar 
are like so terrible that only one in ten survives. However, that one that survives will be like carved out of stone. These guys do not fuck around, they are incredible. Aside from just the Imperial House, there's a bunch of other noble houses which kind of like control a lot of the industries in the universe, and these are known as the Lansrod. The Lansrod represents a feudal system and it's ruled by a lot of lords with various titles. Each one of these noble houses comes into recognition because of their achievements during the Butlerian Jihad. And what this illustrates, and actually pretty geniusly by Frank Herbert, is that there is a ruling class, or a wealthy class, and then the working class, or the peasantry. Which is some pretty incredible social critique, especially because we're kind of dealing with the same stuff now. Again, a great reason to pick up the book. Closely related to the House Carino is House Atreides. The Atreides live on this awesome planet called Caladan, which is like super beautiful and has these oceans and wind and it's like an awesome planet. <laughs> which gets its name from Caliban, who is a character from The Tempest, which is my favorite Shakespeare play. The patriarch of the Atreides is Duke Leto Atreides, and he's like the coolest guy ever. Instead of a wife, he has a concubine named Lady Jessica, and before you get like iffy about the concubine thing, the women in this book are the most important and essential characters, and most of the men are like defined by their relationship to these women. A lot of people think that it's sexist because they saw the David Lynch version, and that is so wrong. This book is incredible towards women, especially for a book written in the 60s from a science fiction writer. Lady Jessica is also a Bene Gesserit, and you get to see most of the story through her point of view. So it's actually, it's, she's really cool. She's pretty much my favorite character in the series. Between them, they have a son named Paul, who's super wise, and he's been getting a lot of training from his mother. Paul's entire journey is like a great conversation about nature versus nurture, because without giving too much away, he's capable of doing some really incredible stuff. And there's a lot of evidence that most of it is because of nature, how he was bred and born, and all of the events that took place before him. But at the same time, he's been getting a lot of training since he was like a baby, and so he has these incredible abilities, but a lot of them were learned. Aside from just the core Atreides family, there's a whole bunch of other major characters in their entourage, such as Gurney Halleck, who's a general of the Atreides army, and he's like a really awesome leader. There's also Duncan Idaho, who's incredibly important, especially in like the later books. He's an expert swordsman, he's like a great fighter for the Atreides, and he's kind of like that Han Solo archetype, you know, like a womanizing hero kind of guy. There's also Dr. Yue, who is the Atreides family physician. A uh, cool thing about doctors in the Duneverse is that they actually receive conditioning when they're like training or whatever. So like they're psychologically not able to take a life. Last of like the core Atreides entourage is Thufir Hawat, who is incredibly important because he's a mentat. Without information technology after the Butlerian Jihad, there's a organization called the Mentats that kind of developed the ability to be human computers. Every single Mentat has like different specialities and they're all good at certain things. And usually each noble house will have at least one, if not more, Mentats in their entourage so that they can figure things out and really control all forms of information. House Harkonnen. If there is one aspect of this book that is just freaking out there and amazing, it is House Harkonnen. The patriarch of House Harkonnen is the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, and he's pretty much like a fat pedophile version of Tyrion Lannister, but evil. He's like super intelligent, and he like makes all these wheels within wheels plans, and he's like a Shakespearean villain to the max, but his outward appearance is just so funny. <laughs> He's so fat that he needs suspensors, which are like anti-gravity whatevers, to actually like move. So I'm guessing he kind of like moon bounces his way to everywhere. He's like really intelligent and he's really intense. Probably one of the most memorable villains in science fiction. The Baron also has a nephew named Fade Rautha and Fade is the Nob Baron, which means that he's like next in line to be the Baron because obviously the Baron doesn't have a wife. And he's like your typical 80s high school bully, but like, old and he kills people. NERDS! 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 
Ah! House Arconan's like ancestral place is Gaty Prime, which is like this awful planet. Before the events of the series, they oversee the mining of something called the Spice, which is the most important substance in the whole universe. The Spice is a consciousness expanding narcotic that also increases your lifespan and if you know how to use it properly, it can unlock like certain mental abilities. Now this isn't just important because it's this really precious material, but it is also absolutely essential for space travel. And this is because it is the only way for the Spacing Guild to be able to see into the future. So the Spacing Guild, they're kind of mysterious and you again don't really get to see them much until the end of the first book. Most of the guild is like your typical workers who end up creating these huge ships called Highliners, but the most important part of the whole Spacing Guild thing is the guild navigators. These guys are... freaky. They become severely mutated because they are constantly surrounded by enriched spice gas and they're constantly ingesting the spice. And this makes the mind so open and they train properly that they can actually see into the future with limited accuracy. Now this is of course incredibly important because before the Butlerian Jihad, you could have computers that would plot out your course to, you know, your destination through the universe. But without them, you could end up hitting into planets or black holes or whatever. So, the amazing thing that the guild navigators are able to do is they can see any potential threats along the way to your destination and plot a course around it. So, again, they're incredibly useful. All of the noble houses actually end up forming a corporation known as CHOME, which stands for Combine Honnet Ober... Advancer Mercantiles. Yes. Each noble house is a shareholder that also oversees some kind of production for everything needed in the known universe. What this also means is that pretty much every single noble house has a monopoly on whatever product they make. So like everybody in your fiefdom is kind of like totally reliant on you for everything and they can charge whatever the hell they want to most people. The only major universal power that's not a part of Chome is, well, the Bene Gesserit, but also the Spacing Guild, which operates independently of the Imperium. Because the Spacing Guild has the only people who have prescience so they can safely navigate through the universe, they represent the only real power that can conflict the Empire, and this makes them incredibly powerful, because without the Spacing Guild, and the Spice for that matter, you ain't got nothing. And this highlights a huge point about Dune, and especially in terms of politics and government and power, which is that when power is held in the hands of the few, and corporation and government have basically become one, everything comes down to stagnancy. When stagnancy starts to corrupt society, the only way to break through it is with revolution. This idea of stagnancy is really important now, especially because despite the fact that our ideas are capable of being spread across the internet in an instant, we are becoming more and more a society that has this realm of capitalization on ideas. You have to pay to be heard, and more importantly, you have to serve the wealthiest people and the rulers of big business and all that other crap to get anywhere. One of the great lessons of Dune is that the impoverished, the resilient, and those who actually work in the realm of materials will have the strength to overcome oppression, but only if they work really hard to achieve revolution. Alright guys, I hope you like this video, and be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you want to get your very own copy of the Folio Society's 50 year anniversary edition of Dune, you can do so by clicking the link below and tell me exactly what you think of the book because I think it is freaking breathtaking. Be sure to stick around for our next video where we talk about the desert planet of Arrakis. We're going to be talking about the spice, about the sandworms, and about the Fremen. Three reasons why you should be watching the next video. Alright guys, I'll see you next time and stick around for more Dune Month.